welcome back. And today we're back onto some PDP-11 stuff, as is probably pretty obvious by the uh, vac station that's sitting next to me. Uh, I realized the other day that I have like five or six PDP-11s here, or at least enough parts to make five or six PDP-11s, but I have never actually seen a PDP-11 running. I think it's a little ludicrous for somebody to have so much PDP-11 kit and have never actually used one. So that's what I want to at least take the first step towards rectifying today. And I wanna do it with this vac station right here. Uh, we got this from Mitch down in Houston who hooked me up with one of the most incredible PDP-11 hauls in history. But even from the very early pictures that he sent me, I spotted this hiding out in in there and I knew immediately that I wanted to build something with it. Uh, I just love how skinny and tall it is. But what I didn't anticipate was how heavy it is. <laughs> My back hurts from just lugging this thing around. It weighs a ton, but I think it's gonna be epic to build this up into a pretty high-powered PDP-11 because even though it says VAC station on the front, it has an H9278 QCD backplane, which means that it can use pretty much any QBUS card, VAX or PDP-11. And it just so happens that I have a really nice PDP-1183 CPU with two PMI memory cards that we got in the original haul that we got from uh, Pittsburgh. That is a great PDP-11 CPU, and I really want to put it in this machine. And so we could theoretically just plug it in right now, throw a terminal on it and see what happens. But it's pretty, it's pretty dirty. <laughs> it, it needs a clean. Not only that, the BA23 chassis that's inside of this also desperately needs a clean. So the whole thing needs to come completely apart so I can uh, essentially strip it down to the bare metal, give it a proper wash, clean everything up, put it back together, and uh, while it's apart, we'll probably need to do a reefa capacitor replacement on the power supply in it. Uh, and then once it's back together, we'll slot the CPU and one memory card into it. We'll hook it up to a terminal and hopefully there's life. Uh <laughs> So I have no idea how this is gonna go, but I do know that the very first step that we gotta do is getting this thing apart so we can give it a proper clean. So let's get to work. First things first, let's pop the front panel off and it's held on by these little plastic Velcro things called dual lock, I believe. Uh, and you can see them here in the top corners while I unscrew the retainer plate for the BA23 chassis inside. And with that uh, retainer plate removed, I can then slide the BA23 out until it hits the stop. And then in order to get it out the rest of the way, we have to remove the stop and it's just two screws on the top. And then the entire BA23 can slide all the way out and allow us to really dig into it to get it clean. And the first step to doing that is getting the cover plates off. With the screws removed, this front plate pulls straight off, giving us access to the drive bay. And then we'll remove the screws and the rear cover, which gives us access to the card cage. And interestingly, this BA23 has a fan shroud over this side fan here. So we'll remove the two screws and then just pull that shroud right out. And that gives us access to the fan and the power supply wires. And next I'll remove the power supply wires and good lord, they are filthy. Just look at what it's done to my fingers. Uh, they're gonna need a proper clean for sure. And I'm gonna need a proper clean for sure as well. Uh, so next we'll remove the front panel power connector and the fan power connector. Then we'll remove the four screws that are holding the fan in place. Then we'll tilt it back and pull it out of the system. And then next, let's get the power supply unit out. With all the screws removed, it just pulls straight up. And then after removing the four screws, we'll pull the back plane out as well. And it's a little fiddly because it's a tight fit, but it came right on out. And finally, we'll remove the front panel. With everything apart, it's time to give it all a good spray down with Simple Green. Then we'll pull the hose out and give it a proper wash to really clean it up nice. And even just spraying it here, I can see that it is shining up beautifully. 
But while the big pieces are out in the sun drying, I'm gonna grab the air hose and give the power supply a proper clean out. And surprisingly, it wasn't that bad, especially after seeing the power supply connectors. But it does have some reefa capacitors in it, so we do actually need to take this thing fully apart. So with the screws removed and the connector disconnected, one half rotates right up out of the way, and that gives us clean access to everything. And here's the offenders, the two reefa capacitors, and they are already cracked and ready to release the magic smoke. So we'll pull the entire board free from the power supply case to get access to the backside, and then I'll get the solder on there nice and hot and pry the capacitor out by pressing on the side of it with my thumb while heating it up. With both reefas removed, I'll slot the new replacement capacitor into place, and then we'll solder it in place with a lot of solder. It solders into a uh, pretty large fill area on the PCB, so it took a little bit of work to get the solder flowing, but uh, now it's time to start bolting things back together. So we'll drop the power supply unit in first, which is fiddly because the fan cable is perpetually in the way, and then we'll get the front panel back in place, followed by the cooling fan and the H9278 QCD backplane. And with the backplane and power supply unit in place, we can now plug in the much cleaner power supply cables. And now we're getting to the exciting bit and we're gonna slot in the 1183 CPU into slot two and lock it down with the locking levers. And then we'll follow that with the 1183 two megabyte PMI memory card into slot one. Next, we need a data terminal. And fortunately, I have this VT320 that I got from Mitch in the Epic Hall he hooked me up with. It does need some cleaning though. So we'll remove the screws off the bottom of the LK201 keyboard here. And we'll pop the cover off, it just rotates right out of the way. Then we'll remove each key, which have these little locking levers on the bottom right and top left. And it's a long, arduous process to remove them all. So I just got some music going in the background and methodically went after it one by one. And with everything removed, I put them all in a little container and let them soak in some warm soapy water for a while. And while they were soaking, I used a paintbrush to clean up all the dust and dirt and filth inside of the keyboard. Then I flipped it over and gave a scrub down to the backside of it to clean it up. And next, I wanna get the monitor looking good as well. And the monitor is more than just a monitor, it contains the terminal board. So we just need to take the two screws off of the bottom and then the top case rotates right off. I then use some compressed air to clean out all the dust inside, which was actually a little worse than I was expecting, but there was nothing too egregious looking. And then I gave the outer cover a nice scrub down with some simple green, a brush, and a lot of rags. And finally, each key needed to be pulled out of the water, wiped down, dried, and reinstalled. And this was a very long and tedious process, so let's just skip to the finished product. All right, I think we should be mostly ready to give this thing a test. I <laughs> haven't turned anything on, so I have no idea how this is gonna go. Could all go up in smoke, but I've got the camera rolling, so if it does, at least we'll get some pretty footage out of it. Uh, on this machine here, I have uh, just the CPU and one memory card installed, and that's it. Uh, but off of the CPU, we do have the console port, which is what the ribbon cables are that run to this little piece right here. So that connects up to our VT320 terminal here, which cleaned up very nicely but I have no idea if it works. So let's uh, give it a shot. I'll go ahead and flip the switch here. And it should be warming up. Oh, it says wait. Oh, all right. Well, it works. It says VT320 keyboard error. That's good. That means that at least most of the terminal is working correctly. It just appears that we've got a keyboard problem. Uh, oh, that's interesting. When I press a key, I get a flashing cursor up here, but uh, that's, that's all I get. Um, so apparently, the keyboard that I spent hours cleaning yesterday is <laughs> having a problem, but I think I have another one of these. Let me pull it out and give that a test. All right, let's try again. This keyboard is filthy. It needs a desperate clean. I, Probably should have checked this before I spent so many hours cleaning this one up. But uh, let's at least give it a shot. Let's see if it works here. 
Uh, so the power's on. It should be warming up. Oh, I see a wait light showing up here. A beep VT320 OK firmware and setup screens, copyright 1987, Digital Equipment Corporation. That's working. That's awesome. So at the very least, we have a functioning VT320. Now let's see if something happens when I turn the power on to this guy. Hopefully we see something show up here and we see some of the LEDs here do something. So here goes nothing. 77, 64, 62. We got a bunch of junk on the screen here. 46. I have no idea. Oh, 31. I don't know if that, <laughs> I don't know if that means anything. Uh, it could be that I have the baud rate set incorrectly. I don't know what the baud rate of the VT320 is supposed to be, because right now I've got it set to 38.4, it looks like. So uh, let's flip that off and try again here, because maybe that'll change something. All right, let's, <laughs> this is exciting. Let's do some stuff here. All right, I've got the baud rate set to 9600 now. That's the standard baud rate that the Centurion uses, so we'll just uh, give that a shot. Hopefully it clears the screen and does something interesting here, so. Uh, no, now I'm not getting anything. <laughs> I think that is a successful boot of the machine. We're just, we're not getting it to the terminal here, but we were getting something close to the terminal. Uh, I, man, I wish I knew what it was supposed to be set at. <laughs> All right, I think I've cracked it. Uh, I needed to get into the setup of the VT320 here. The Centurion terminals all have it on dip switches in the back, but there's none of that on here. And you have to get into setup by actually pressing a key, which in this case is uh, F3. That gets you to the setup directory here. Um, and then we go over to COM. So 9600 baud. We want 8 bits, no parity, 1 stop bit. That's what it's set at right now. Uh, it was originally set at something else, 7 bits, something like that. No parity, even parity, or something like that. But let's go with 8 bits, no parity. Uh, and so we'll exit out of setup here. Let's flip the power on. There we go. <laughs> yes. Testing in progress. Please wait. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9... Message 07, none of the selected devices were bootable. Press return key when ready to continue or to list boot messages. Uh, trying DU0, non-existent controller. Uh, entering dialog mode. Commands are help, boot, list, setup, map, and test. Let's do uh, help here. Look at the smooth scroll of the VT320, that's wild. <laughs> Uh, all right, help is, well, this message. Boot, load, and start a program from a device. List, list boot programs. Setup is enter setup mode. Map is map memory and IO page. Test is a continuous self-test. Uh, see what happens if we go to setup here. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, man. We have so many different things that we can control. That's insane. All right, let's go, let's go back and uh, do, let's go back to help one more time here. Uh, let's try map. Let's see what map takes us to. 18 megahertz, CPU options, FPA, starting address is 0000, ending address is whatever that is. Uh, two megabytes in memory. So <laughs> that's... That's perfect. Bus type is PMI. That shows that our 1183 CPU is working perfectly. Our One of our memory cards is working perfectly. And they're set up correctly to use the QCD backplane. That's awesome. This is the first time I've ever seen this screen. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Uh, so now the next thing is to get the second memory card in there, bump it up to four megabytes, make sure that we still get it all in here. Uh, but before I get to that, I got to do something about this keyboard. It's driving me bananas. So I got to clean this, then we'll put the other memory card in and uh, get back into this screen and hopefully it says four megabytes of memory. Oh, this is awesome. 
I have absolutely no idea why, but uh, I really didn't want to clean up that other keyboard after I spent so much time cleaning this one up. So I went ahead and plugged it back in just to see, <laughs> and it seems to be working fine now. I can get into setup just fine. The keys work, it boots up exactly like it's supposed to. So, uh, well, we're just gonna use the clean one until it stops working again. So I slid in the second memory card that I had. So we should have four megabytes of ECC PMI memory. So let's kick the power on here. Uh, there we go, we're counting down, testing in progress. Uh, yeah, there we go, message 07, press return key when ready. Uh, Non-existent controller, that's totally expected. We don't have any uh, drive control stuff plugged in at all. Uh, so let's just go to map, M-A-P. The keyboard seems to be working perfectly, that's awesome. Uh, there we go, 18 megahertz FPA detected both of our memory boards. Uh, although interestingly, the size in kilobytes is slightly different between them. 2048 versus 2040. Maybe it just means that uh, it uses that memory card a little differently than it uses the one in the lower address space here. Uh, so we'll hit return here. And this shows us the IO page map. Uh, so at starting address 17765000 to 17765776, that's our CPU ROM or EEPROM. Then we have memory CSRs, supervisor I and D, kernel I and D, MMR, CPU ROM. Oh man, we got a bunch of stuff going on here. Well, there we have it. It is fully working, or as far as the CPU and the memory is concerned. We have booted up into dialog mode. We can see a bunch of really cool stuff about what the actual machine is doing, and it appears that everything is working correctly. That is epic. So I today here on this video for the very first time in my life have experienced a PDP-11 and it's only the tip of the iceberg. Things go very crazy and deep from here because we got to start getting some uh, drives set up on this thing so we can actually get into some real genuine software, start using uh, an operating system, maybe like a, a RSX 11, I think, or something like that. I think I have a copy of that floating around here. Uh, and then we got to start finding out what's on a lot of the drives and disks that I have saved. And ultimately, I want to start getting some graphical capabilities out of this because this VT320 is beautiful and I love it and I'm definitely going to keep it. But uh, I ultimately want to use the Princeton Multisync monitor with the Bowman keyboard, which both are meant to interface with the Deb 41, which gives us, I think, 16 colors when it's paired with the Matrox QRGB. But getting those going is going to be very difficult or interesting. It's going to require a lot of reading of the manuals, which thankfully I have. Now the Matrox QRGB manual is available on BitSavers, I believe, but the Bowman manual is not. So I'm going to have to sit down and scan it, make a PDF of it, so that way I can share it with the world because that's a pretty rare piece of equipment. But this is, this is a massive milestone for this machine because it is it's working. We have a functioning PDP-1183 in this room with all of the other mini computers that we have going on. And this is going to make a beautiful machine when it's bolted into that tall skinny tower over there that we cleaned up. So, oh man, I am so excited about this project. I am so excited that the machine actually booted and is working and is running. And if you guys like more PDP-11 stuff, well, definitely hang around because there's a lot of PDP stuff to come. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next episode.